So today we'll finish up the restoration of the Amiga 2500 with a video toaster that we started last time. So as you saw in the last video, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole on the Amiga 2500 motherboard. It was like two days of messing around with that thing before I got my head out of my arse and got back on track. But now the motherboard and the power supply seem to be in really good shape. Next we need the floppy drive, the accelerator card, the hard card, the video toaster, I hope. And then I'd also like to get a hard drive and a GoTech installed so I have a place to install software and a way to transfer it from my PC. So without further ado, let's get started. So while I was able to boot the machine with an external 1010 floppy drive, I was not able to get the internal drive to work initially. I did a bunch of work on it, and I'm going to kind of cut to the chase on this one because this drive has got issues, and I decided to set it aside for a future floppy repair-a-thon. I cleaned it up, lubricated it, did just about everything except I haven't done the recap on it yet, and it causes errors on disks even when it's reading them. I don't know if this is a magnetism issue or what. But three out of four times, just booting off of a good workbench disk will leave that disk with sector errors. And these same errors exist if I try to boot off that disk now in the Amiga 500. I just really want to get this machine going, and frankly, the floppy that came in it is ugly anyway, so I was kind of hating it. So there was the floppy that was in the boxes. There's a high-density one, but there's also just a standard floppy drive. It's a Chinon 354. So I went ahead and swapped to this other floppy drive. It's really crusty. I'm hoping I can get it working. It's got all kinds of corrosion on it. Uh, but let's see what we can get out of it. I uh, started by doing a little bit of pre-testing on it and the heads are not moving. I figure that's probably just needing to lubricate it. So went ahead and pulled it apart, stripped it down. I started out by cleaning up the crusties on the motor. So normally I'd then coat this rust with something, a paint or something, but in this case, I didn't want to throw the motor out of balance and I didn't want to repaint the entire flywheel. So looking inside, this floppy is full of dust. There's dust in all the mechanism and there's even a wad of dust in the home position sensor, which certainly can cause issues. So I start out by blowing out as much of the junk as I can. Normally I don't recommend blowing out a floppy drive unless you're gonna do a full restoration as I am, because you might just end up blowing dust into places where you don't want it, like the home position sensor. When I went to remove the controller off the floppy drive, I did find that one of the screws was really corroded. It took a little work to get it loose and it doesn't bode well for the condition of this board. Once I had the board off, I carefully disconnected all of the wires. These uh, flat flex cables can be really delicate. Next, I cleaned what I could just with a scratch pen and alcohol just to get the nastiest of the crusties off. Recapping the board was a pain in the butt. This solder is really corroded and does not want to melt. It took repeated applications of more solder and flux and using the solder braid to remove the solder and just till I finally got it cleared. I just took my time, did it really carefully. I did not want to lift any traces off this board. And in the end, it came off pretty well. After the long, laborious process of getting the old caps off, putting the new ones on just took a couple of minutes. Uh, once the board was all cleaned up, everything went in just like a piece of cake. No, no, really, a piece of cake, not the piece of cake from last video. This is a real piece of cake. So to clean up the nasty screw, I attached it to a standoff, and that way I was able to hold it while I hit it with the scratch pen. It didn't come out perfect, but it's better, and I prefer to use the original parts when I can. My eye is just a watering. Oh, I'll show you guys in a minute what it looks like outside my shop and you understand why my eyes are watering so bad in these videos. So the mechanism got cleaned really well using cotton swabs and alcohol, being really careful not to leave little fuzzies from the swabs behind. Uh, then I added a little bit of Deoxit D5 into the floppy detect switches. This is a common issue that was not common back in the day, never had a problem with them back then, but I see people having issues with them all the time nowadays. Cleaning the heads is just the same as it was back in the day when you were inside a drive. Just use a Q-tip and alcohol, clean them really good, make sure and get the crusties off, but be careful not to damage them. So I was concerned about some of the traces on the motorboard. I pulled out my meter and checked them really carefully and everything seemed just fine. Now that everything's cleaned up, I reattached the controller and was really careful putting the wires back in. You wanna make sure these flat flex cables don't get damaged because that's easy to do. 
after lubricating the motor shaft and the rail that the head rides on, it was still having trouble moving the head. It would not home if you turned it on while the head was moved manually away from the home position. Then I noticed that where the shaft comes out of the motor, that was a brass bushing and not a plastic one. And brass bushings require a little bit of lubricant to work right. So I put the tiniest drop of TriFlow lubricant that has Teflon in it just down into that bushing. And after that, the head started moving much better. It was still a little crunchy at first, but as it worked in, it got nice and smooth. Now, with everything cleaned, lubed, and the old caps replaced, it's just a matter of cleaning up the exterior parts and putting it all back together. Now it's all cleaned up and back together for installation soon. Let's hope it works as good as it looks. So now that the floppy is restored, I'm gonna go ahead and restore the hard drive. It wasn't booting, so it would spin up. It sounded horrible, but it wouldn't boot at all. And as I showed in the last video, there's some corrosion around the termination resistors. So I started by pulling the controller board off this drive, and once I got it off, it was clear there were some more issues. There's a foam-coated plastic insulation sheet, and the foam is breaking down and adhering to the board. Taking a look at the board, it just looks like it's got some crusties on it, so I started out by cleaning all of that up. So on the top side of the board, I just used a scratch pen and carefully removed all the corrosion, cleaned everything up as best I could, and put everything back together. Uh, hopefully we'll get something out of it. I would really like to recover the data from these because there's some software on these machines, I hope, that is no longer available out in the world. This machine has labels on the back for the Magni boards that were in the box. They're not in the machine when I got it. It's possible this hard drive could have the missing drivers and software for those boards. So for the accelerator card, it looked really good except being dirty and grimy. So I cleaned it up really good. There were no electrolytic caps to replace. There was no thermal grease. So I went ahead and put it back together and set it aside to test. So next came the hard card and it was pretty much the same story. It was just dirty. There was nothing to replace on it. I cleaned it up really good. But other than that, it didn't need anything. Finally, the video toaster. And I can't wait to play with this thing. So it was grimy beyond belief and it's three boards attached together so the first thing I did is take it all apart so I can get to everything. The dirt and grime on this thing was just monumental. I spent probably hour and a half, two hours cleaning and cleaning and cleaning but other than that it seemed pretty good. I thought this heat sink was a little janky attached on with a zip tie but the zip tie seemed to still be flexible and wasn't brittle so I went ahead and reused it. So now I feel like we're getting somewhere. All the major components are restored. So next I need to put it all together. And before I do that, I need to clean everything. So the cosmetic restoration is next. I spent quite a bit of time cleaning the case. The main thing I used was glass cleaner and some light scrubbing with a magic eraser. Before the magic eraser, of course, I scrubbed what I could off just with a shop towel. The magic eraser works great to get all the grime out of the nooks and crannies that just a shop towel doesn't get to. So the top and the bottom of the case got cleaned up nicely. So I still needed to deal with the bent case bottom. So I decided the best way to do that was just with some basic percussive maintenance. I went ahead at this time and on the bottom of the case, I replaced the feet. I couldn't find the proper cork feet that I wanted. So I went ahead and used these floor protection pads. They're self-adhesive. They're just the right diameter. They're just a little bit taller, but they work nicely. I was really happy with the front of the case. It cleaned up really nicely. Before putting the motherboard back in, I had to clean up the RF shield and the insulator for that. Those cleaned up nicely, installed the motherboard back into them, returning all the 20 million screws that are required, and returned the board into the bottom case. And I'm starting to feel like we're getting a machine, so woohoo! I can't wait to get this thing going. So the case really feels like it needs a support of this inside frame. So I went ahead and installed the bottom frame and the power supply, leaving the top frame that the drives attached to out because they're accessible. At this point, I installed the accelerator board and the hard card into their respective slots and connected all the cables. One thing I was pleased to find was that the proper standoffs for the floppy drive were just doubled up in installing the funky glued up one that was in here before. So it installed perfectly. The GoTech was a bit of a pain in the neck. 
I would ordered it with the frame and standoffs of the Amiga 2000, but it turns out that the standoffs don't line up with the holes in the GoTek, which is just ridiculous. Uh, also, the frame was printed in gray. It doesn't match either the GoTek or the Amiga. I don't know what they were thinking, but for now, it's what I got. So to get the GoTek in the right position, I had the floppy mounted and I test fit to make sure it was mounted in the case properly. Next, I installed the standoffs for the GoTek and I just put them onto the frame in approximately the same positions that they were on the floppy. Then I positioned the GoTek exactly where I wanted it and glued it. Put a little weight on it and let it dry. It seemed to be pretty well attached. So then I put a bead of super glue around each of the standoffs and put baking powder in it, which massively strengthens the super glue. This worked great, and once it was mounted in place, other than the colors, it looks like it was made to go here. The toaster has to go in before the inner frame goes on, so I removed the screws from that, flipped it out of the way, and installed the toaster in the video slot. Once the inner frame was back in its place, it's time for the moment of truth. Is it all gonna work? Nope. The floppy drive and GoTek seem to be having issues. Give me a minute, I need to look at this. I messed with this thing for quite a while, and in the end what I found is that the floppy and the GoTek were both trying to be DF0. The instructions I had for the GoTek said that with a twist in the cable you don't change the jumpers on the GoTek. That is not correct, at least on this newer type of GoTek. I had to move the jumper over from S0 to S1, and now everything works fine. The floppy drive is showing up as DF0, the GoTek is showing as DF1. If I have a disk in the actual floppy, it'll boot off of that. If I don't have a disk in the floppy, I can go ahead and select the workbench disk image off of the thumb drive on the GoTek and it works great, it boots right off of that. So now that things are working, it's time to close up the case. I decided to run power and SCSI cables out the back so that I have easy access for testing hard drives. Okay, so now that we've got it put together, let's see how it works. So it's taken a little while, and I believe this is because it's looking for a hard drive. Since there's a hard card in there, the hard disk drive is uh, flickering. So we got a kickstart screen asking for a workbench. This is a workbench version 2. All right, boot it up. So, one meg of chip, eight megs of fast, so that's all working great. Uh, if I take the thumb drive and put it into the GoTek, what happens? All right, <laughs> it's set for workbench right now, but that's showing up as well. So, so far so good, but not much to see on a basic workbench. So now let's see what happens if we try hooking up the hard drive. Okay, and that's that hard drive. Still sounds like it's on a uh, countdown to detonation, but uh, it's not terrible, and it seems to be booting. Got hard disk activity light. We got two drives, DH1 and Workbench. So, B Titler 2, Deluxe Paint 4, Directory Opus, Newsroom, one hour, Showtime, and Profils 2. I don't know what any of this stuff is. I'm not an expert on it. Although I think this must be Steve's stuff. News font, can do, quarterback, graphics, Deluxe Paint 4, DigiPaint 3, DigiView 4, and Pixmate. Ooh. That didn't sound good. Don't die on me, hard drive. We are looking for stuff for the, uh, the Magnes. For DH0, we got Deluxe Paint 4, Election Generic, Expansions, the B Titler, uh, Quarterback, Rex, Storage System, Tools, Utilities, Workbench Startup, a whole lot of stuff in the boot sequence. You know, I wonder what happens if I try to boot off of DH1, because it seems to have a full install on it. So let's see what that does. So what I'm going to do here is to boot off the other hard drive. I will turn it on and then hold down both mouse buttons, and I should get a menu to choose which drive to boot from. There we go. 
So there's dH0, so here's dH1. See what happens. Pretty much all the same stuff. What I'm not seeing is the Magni stuff. So at this point, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to shut this down and pull this hard drive off of here. It's making some horrible sounds, and I want to reserve it until I have a way to back it up. So let's take a look. There was another drive that I've played with a little bit already, and that drive was just in the box loose, and it's a small 52 meg drive, but it's got work, it had Workbench 1.3. I've already upgraded it to 2.0 because I was having issues. Um, so let's play with that. And while it's booting, I should mention that I discovered that if I want to boot off of the GoTech, I have to use the two mouse button trick. Um, otherwise, it boots off the hard drive every time. If I put a disk into DF0, it goes ahead and boots off of that. But to boot off a of DF1, I have to use the two button trick. Oh, here. Oh, yeah, I forgot. This drive's 97% full, but there was room for one thing to play with. This is such a classic. Designed by Sid Meier. With Bruce Shelley. Okay, guys, I think that's enough. Time to go home. Aw, just one more turn, please. One more. It'll only take one. One turn. Okay, you guys can keep playing. Go ahead.